Welcome to The Bird Who Made Me Happy. This is Alicia Bridge and I am your host. We're going to dive into the topic of what is it about bird songs that makes us so happy. You had a daughter and you bought a home. When I think about why I first became intrigued about bird songs, I can honestly say it might have been the stress of motherhood and the need to find some calm amongst everything. It could have also been my worry about the pandemic. Either way, I was on the search for answers for how to cope with the stress I was experiencing. And then one day, on a drive, I heard a bird song. And it changed me. The times are different. My next guest is Anna Maria Postotti. She is a horticulturist, holds a PhD in landscape planning and environmental psychology, and is an associate professor at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Her research engages the question of how do outdoor environments affect human health and well-being, and in particular, benefit those experiencing burnout and mental exhaustion. I am so thrilled to be having this time with you. Well, thank you for asking me. I think there will be listeners who are not familiar with nature-based rehabilitation. And I'm really curious if you could describe a little bit about what it is. Yes, we here in the Nordic countries call it nature-based intervention. The nature is the base for your intervention. Mm. So instead of being indoors, you go outdoors. And that's your base. And you can choose different kinds of nature. You can be on the seashore, waterfront, quite often referred to as a blue landscape. And then you have forest, you have wilderness therapies, and you have uh, specially designed gardens or environment, Mm -hmm. or you can just use what you have. So our research has shown that when we move outdoors, there is a shift in the power balance between the therapist and the person. So... I'm not wearing my white coat when I go out in therapy session. I I just have normal clothes. And then both the therapist and the client, they say that there is a shift and we can meet more as human beings. Mm. And I can help you and I can support you in your therapy process. But nature becomes also part of this supportive process. Mm. And we use the word intervention as uh, the World Health Organization. That can be prevention, promotion, and rehabilitation. So before we kind of jump into the birds, I'm curious what sort of clientele or health issues that you're focusing on. Yes, it was called mental exhaustion, Mm. even referred to as burnout, where your body just shut off. Ah. In this clinical ICDS system, it has its own uh, number. And it's actually Sweden that has been running this. But it's kind of getting uh, accepted in other countries as well. But this is like an official diagnosis. Okay. And it was uh, depression and anxiety as well. Mm -hmm. But the mental exhaustion is actually the primary diagnosis for getting into the program. And so what is the correlation between the burnout and the nature intervention? What is the nature intervention doing for the person who shows up with burnout? where you have people with stress-related mental disorder that have been on a sick leave for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. They either have shut down the system, they don't feel anything, they don't see anything, they just kind of shut down, or they're hypersensitive. So smell and sound, it was like too much, and even hugging mm-hmm. and touching. Mm-hmm. But you could see in the beginning that people, for example, those had shut down, they need to train the ears and the smell and the touch again. You see, but you're, you're not like focusing on here and now. So this is a typical exercise we use in, in this rehabilitation program is just find a place where you feel secure and comfortable mm-hmm. and close your eyes. Listen what's around you and smell what's around you, feel what's around you. And sometimes you just take one sensory system to like, what can you hear? And 
I have done then this interview study over five years. So people that have been going through this express, this was like a breakthrough uh, for them to be mm. kind of stopped and invited to just be here and now and use the senses. From their own lips, they say, I came back to life. I came back to life. And they talked about as you implement it into your everyday life. And people, for example, saying that living in the countryside, I never had heard the birds. But all of a sudden, when I was taking my coffee out on the balcony, I was just listening. So it was a turning point. And I think this is actually something we need to do is invite people, regardless of age, to listen to the soundscape. What's here? Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about the qualities or aspects of an environment that you have noticed are more therapeutic? Well, it's personal. Mm. You bring with you, where are you raised? Okay, I'm raised in, in a landscape that is the sea shore or, or the waterscape. It's a lot of blue. But moving to Sweden with all this forest, I felt at home. But I think I was introduced to this landscape in a way we connected. Mm. It was not scary. I felt safe. And that's something that is really important in, in all landscape is that when you enter in this context that you feel safe. But if you have go back to the rehab garden, what we can see for the people with the, the burnout is that they would like to have more wild dish, free growing, but not this structure, mm. fine beddings, uh, line, everything is kept tidy. Then they start like, oh, sh <gasps> somebody has to work here. I need, do I need to work here? And higher biodiversity also attract more insects, that means more birds. So if you would have more sterilized garden, go from the indoor sterilized to the outdoor, very neat and nice kept garden. Mm. But when they come to the part that is more freely growing, uh, soft mm. lines, they usually say, nature is in control, I can let go, I can just be here. So for that group, more natural, free-growing vegetation has shown to be more restorative. Oh my gosh. Being in an environment where there's not an expectation that in order for it to be look good or be good, you have to do something. It's much more passive. Yeah, exactly. And also because a lot of people that have diagnosed with burnout, they often had a very demanding work, mm -hmm. lots of deadline. Maybe have a challenging situation mm -hmm. at home, but when you walk in this kind of nature, you're not expected to deliver anything. You can just enjoy it. And the participants have described also that when you don't have these demands, you can just be there and start to experience in a pleasant mm -hmm. way what's around you. Yeah. You know, what I hear in that is the sense of when someone is in burnout and they're shut down, like there's just so much directed attention mm -hmm. that part of your work is reducing the demands, the actual expectations, and that that's broadening their ability or the, the room for them to be able to take in new soundscapes. But you're assuring that those soundscapes or those smellscapes or visuals are all positive, that they're safe, that they're going to be um, rewarding in some way, shape, or form so that that encourages them to kind of experience more of it. Can we speak a little bit to, to birds? You know, what's your experience in doing this research or with the clients of how birds are impacting them? Like, where do they kind of fit on that scale of pleasing to displeasing? Absolutely. The soundscape of birds in the rehab context or rehabilitation garden they are like small birds that are non-threatening small birds that just go about their own business and singing for each other and being more like a happy. We have certain birds that people recognize as pleasant and mm -hmm. that's between not too high tones to a degree of melody. Mm. But as for when they are the same wavelength and the same tone, just being multiple times, it's less pleasant. Then you have the same sequence over and over. That's not really doing anything more than like picking you. Deck, 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 deck. Yeah. Did not catch any negative sounds from the birds in the garden, but people had some reflections about birds in other contexts. And then they mentioned even pigeon and seagulls. Uh, for me, it was like, especially seagulls, it was really fascinating to ask why, how. 
And that's often related to a memory from a context that wasn't pleasant. But generally, the bird song in the garden is a dimension that the participants or, or the clients, they feel they're part of a bigger context. We're not just alone in this context. And the birds are representing a life. It's a living uh, environment. And they're quite often compared to being indoor in the rehab there are no natural sounds, there are no birds. So this is also bringing them to life. Again, we talk about being in this nature context, you feel alive. Yeah, I mean, can you speak a bit more to this, this like aliveness? What's your perception of what's happening when people feel that they're connected to, to their surroundings? My observation from that is that people come to life. So they also confirm it when we do the interview. And coming to life and being alive is that being part of a bigger context. It's not just myself and my problem. So your mind is not concentrated in your body. It can You can just let go of thoughts. They don't stay as much in your head. And you can even speak them to nature. And then they just stay there. And nature doesn't reply back. It doesn't judge you. It just receives your feelings regardless what they are. And what I also have seen is that in the beginning, you need the team. Gradually, you let go of that and become more independent. And you are part of your own healing process. You own it and you share it and experience it with the garden or outdoor environment. So we can see the same thing in programs that are in different kinds of landscape where nature becomes kind of embracing you or holding you in your process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really resonate with that sense of it's almost like an unconditional love. In those settings, there's a feeling of safety. The environment is is in and of itself calm or nurturing. We have this very interesting researcher in Sweden, Kerstin Uvnes Moberg. She has been studying the hormone oxytocin. Done some very interesting studies it's going from the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. They're also called flight and fight system sympathetic system where you are shutting down the system because you have to be alerted and you're focusing. When we come into a situation where we feel at ease, safe, and can have this positive stimuli, we can move over to the parasympathetic system where you have different kinds of flows of hormone, happy hormones, love hormones, she calls them as well. We can build trust. So we interpretate our results that this could be happening but we need more research. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my understanding was that, and perhaps this was your colleague who had studied bringing in nature soundscapes into a virtual reality to see if they had a similar impact. They're actually, they measured and then they could see that you're swifting over to the parasympathetic system when you have the bird song and the virtual reality of, of this garden or greenery. But then also one thing I find interesting is that when do you expect the bird sound? Because there have been some marketing issues about trying to put bird sounds into the grocery stores. And then you have the side of some people thinking about, oh, are they all over the place? Or <laughs> Yeah. And so you can have counterproductive effects of putting in bird song. You have to think about, is it always pleasant? Or it's mm. more pleasant when it's in this right context. Yeah. Really appreciate how you are looking at that. I like that there's awareness into the fact these are not universal things, you know, that someone's history affects it, that the contest affects it. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to where you've been surprised by someone's positive response or negative response to birdsong. In a hospital in Denmark, Copenhagen, they have uh, built out a outdoor ring in front of the children's unit. And they had different soundscape there. And there the children started to look for the birds. So, mm. okay, you have the exciting part of where is the bird, but you never see that bird. You can also have the disappointment that you never saw the bird. Mm. So if you mm. want to add soundscape, for example, for, for children with the, bird, with the bird sound, but you want to have them fascinated, Maybe you should put off a bird feeder as well. So mm. if they're looking out, not outdoors, they could still see that uh, this is real life. So mm-hmm. it needs to have some kind of connection, not just to be a sound, 
Yeah, it makes so much sense. Like they're experiencing something and that they're curious. And now there's this lost opportunity Mm -hmm. for them to be able to connect deeper with that. Mm -hmm. What I understand is that we can't just apply the concept of bird songs are valuable and make that a universal. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates a little bit. I was reading a little bit about your supportive environment theory. Mm-hmm. And that that different people coming into the therapeutic garden based on how stressed they are respond differently. Is that correct? Could you yep. share a little bit about that? We can say that this is supportive environment theory is that more vulnerable people, and that means you have vulnerability to the sensory impression and sensory stimuli. And either as we talked about before here, that you turn it off because you just have to survive or you are over uh, sensitive. So we need to also think about what kind of sensory impression we are facilitating. Mm -hmm. Quite often what you can manage is actually nature, stone, water, plants, Mm -hmm. those animals living in this environment naturally, because it is still too demanding to have the social interaction. So you could say you have different levels of your ability to cope with what you're exposed mm-hmm. to. And quite often this target group, uh, there's this social aspect of being in a social context is really demanding. So mm-hmm. quite often they have isolated themselves. They don't go to parties anymore. Stop being in the choir because it's too demanding. Mm-hmm. Quite often that's the first sign you cut off the social because you need to keep your energy. You need yeah. your health. And then you gradually might lose this. Also, people can build this up again. And Mm -hmm. so have from our studies in the rehab garden, people telling how they even couldn't hug their families. They were so vulnerable. They were just so fragile that they thought they would just break. Mm -hmm. Specifically of one woman that's really touching that she said, can you imagine I can hug my children? And I couldn't do that three months ago right your process then is that when someone comes in that is in this state of of overwhelm Mm. you know where they're they've shut down they're they've let go a lot of their social interactions is that you're you begin the process of exposing them or participating within nature without any of those social interactions that you it's a really slow kind of building process and almost it sounds like you you kind of like stabilize or ground mm. their system in the safe environment and then mm. work up to it. Yeah. And as they say yeah. themselves, I was grounded and I built up my energy and strength again. Yeah. I have been working with the healthcare authorities here in Skåne. This kind of concept is now implemented in healthcare. So would I be diagnosed with those conditions? I can have as an add on to my therapy eight weeks on the countryside or say peri urban uh, agriculture businesses where the main intention is to provide a breathing space to just be. There you don't have a medical staff because this medical staff is at the healthcare facilities, but this is like kind of giving you your own time and space for healing and connecting with nature. There is something that happens. When you move outdoor and if you kind of own it, then you can be very successful. It almost sounds like the need for solitariness. We actually have a word for that. We call it social quietness. Oh, I love it. And that that was a word coming in Swedish then over and over in the interview saying this need of social quietness. And when I ask what is the social quietness, it is actually the need of being alone with nature, very private. And you don't want to share it with others. And also, if somebody came too close, this connection or this communication was interrupted. Mm -hmm. And so they really said that they needed this to be in their own bubble with nature, Mm -hmm. what they call social quietness. Yeah. And I get this is part of Mm. that when we're in these burnout situations, we don't actually get that quietness to be able to reflect and process and... Mm. you know make decisions about our life is that does that sound right is that what's happening yes that's actually what it's really nice put as you said and this is actually what we also have put forward in our discussion of results that this could be happening Mm -hmm. that you have time of course as you say for reflecting be grounded in the environment grounded in yourself 
start to reflect and you have the support from the rehab team in this process as well but you are taking the mandate and running your own process you own it yeah. as they call it themselves i own my process nobody else owned it amazing mm -hmm. you know you've spoken a little bit about your childhood mm -hmm. and i'm i'm so curious how we arrive in the work we do now and what are the roots in our childhood that got us there and i'm wondering do you see a part of your childhood that has motivated you towards this work yes because when i grew up we had a very much free space of being outdoors experiencing and doing stuff that i wouldn't want my kids to do <laughs> <laughs> they're like really rocky seashore and we are just climbing it and the waves are coming but yes i would say definitely i had parents that when everybody went abroad to spain on summer holiday we just drove another round a circle around iceland camping but I feel now I have so much more from connecting to nature because mm. I got to see so many different landscapes. Mm -hmm. so we talk about nature deficiency for children, and mm. I think that's something really serious. I think also specific teachers have in, inspired me to how I teach today because there was not just looking at the books and reading the books, but taking us out and seeing how is it really. I think about the birds, for example to not just learning about them in the book, but just sitting and watching them, this mm -hmm. observation, what's happening mm -hmm. there. I think that's the best thing we can do for our children mm -hmm. because I was also helped to notice things around mm -hmm. me. And that's how I do in my research. I notice things that are around me and I'm interested to know how it is for other people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sense of wanting to connect mm. to your environment and then wanting to understand how others are perceiving it, how others are, are benefiting from it. I just want to briefly share, I have never understood how people know so many birds. Mm. I would go out with naturalists and they would be like, oh, that's a spotted towie and there's a mm. goldfinch. And I'd be like, what are you talking? I didn't even see the bird. But we have since put out a bird feeder. And now I understand how someone knows these things is that direct interaction. Mm. We see the bird and I can't stop looking at it. I know the sound of the woodpecker now because they've come onto the suet and I can hear them in the kitchen and we're all running. There's the woodpecker, the downy's back. Yeah. <laughs> so my last question is, do you have a favorite songbird or bird? One that you hear and yeah. you stop all things? Yes, and that's actually from this camping trip in Iceland because early in the morning, it would be four o'clock or something, I don't know what's the name of uh, this bird in... They start very early in the morning, to start to Twitter and, and sing. And that's for me, like going one more round, a circle around Iceland camping, mm. waking up in the morning, listening to this wonderful bird song. Instead of having an alarm clock, you have this really nice bird song. Mm -hmm. When I hear this singing here in Sweden, I can relax. I know I can take it easy. Yeah. Yeah, those cues, mm. nature cues that it can relax. And of course, I love the seagulls. <laughs> I, I really like, that's for me, my exploration, the beach and the waterscape. Mm, yeah. Anna-Maria, it has been such a delight talking to you. I'm so grateful for your curiosity. You not only have this incredible way of understanding what's going on but I love your ability to see people are diverse and that they need different circumstances I'm so grateful to have had this chance to to get to speak with you and to be able to share your perspective and thank you Alicia for having me and for bringing up the birds you yeah.